S&P setting up a multi-year cup and handle breakout, the NASDAQ breaking out of their cup and handle, and currently 7% away from all-time highs. Why the 10-year treasury is driving the entire move. What is the risk-free rate and why you should care. S&P forward earnings yield versus the 10-year tips yield and why it matters. Tesla's recent move and its significant break. Taiwan Semi's recent news and how it changes nothing. NVIDIA's recent move ahead of the last major earnings announcement of the year. Dell's all-time high breakout and what it means for the economy. We have a ton to go over. Let's get to it. This video is packed. I'm just going to tell you that ahead of time. So start with the basics. We can see that we are back over the 55. I use a 12, a 22, and a 55. You should use what you're comfortable with. Now just a demarcation line. Should we be doing swing trades when you're above the 12? Yes. Who's in charge? 22, bulls or bears? Bulls. 55, do I have institutional support? Yes. Here's where this gets even more interesting. Look at how this is playing out right here. You have a megaphone. That's really impressive. I thought for sure on Thursday, and this is what I, what happens when you when you think, but I thought for sure on Thursday that we would see some weakness. You got right to the neckline. Usually you reject those necklines, and that's not really what happened here at all. And I think that's very pertinent that we should deal with. Now, some people say, well, we didn't get all the way through. Uh, it's going to be dependent upon where you're going to put it. I'm going to leave it rough at that 4,400 because I think that that is the most important level for us. It was really like 4,403, but I'm going to say 4,400. And I'm going to say that we're through. Some people are going to use 4,423 or 4,436. I think we're splitting semantics. I think you have to look at what happened here and the fact and we're going to talk about why this is happening in great detail. You're going to understand exactly why this is happening. We're going to get into, as we always do, with the stool and understand the macro side of this. And you really need to get this today. So there's a lot of education in here today. But see this flip? Undercut rallies. Okay, now I've got a bullish engulfing and a megaphone on the S&P. You want to bet against that? That's up to you. I did think that there would be some kind of pullback and some kind of rotation, but we're not getting that kind of rotation that I was looking for. You know, you start looking at the uh, Russell, I'm still not getting what I was looking for out of that. And we'll have to see if I do get it or not. But right now it's still going into the ES and it's really going into the NASDAQ more than anywhere else. Uh, these bars, and we should just talk about this, you're opening at the low, you're closing at the high repeatedly. These bars on your pullbacks, this is why I thought we may actually finally see a pullback. If you look at these bars, let's just dive right in here and just go, there's no 50% retracement on any of these bars. Now, even here, you're at the high end. Here, you're at the high end. This was the first time you got a retracement. So you're on a neckline and you're looking at this going, well, and again, I'm a technical trader. You're looking at that neckline going, well, if I was going to do some kind of retracement to give some of this back to set up the push, that's where it would happen. I've been making references to this that it's very much like 2003 when we had the war where oil was. You're going to see some similarities today in some of these things we're about to go over when we start diving into earning yield, why you need to watch the bond market. You're going to start seeing a lot of similarities actually. But what's most important about this is it doesn't really matter because this is what happened. Right. So again, what we do is we trade what's in front of us. Let's just drop that right there so you can see how far back that goes. No matter how you slice this, you must close above this level after an undercut of a low in order to have a double bottom. A double bottom does not need to be at the bottom of the chart, by the way, guys. So that's what you have right now. A higher high would be confirmation of that. It is very hard to see minus some information out there that's going to change this. Now you have this on watch downgrade that hit by Moody's this week at the close on Friday. Maybe it's an event on Monday, maybe it's not. I'm not so entirely sure. If someone could tell me where else they're gonna get a risk-free rate like the US Treasury, then maybe you could tell me what the issue really is. In the meantime, I'm just gonna blow it off and say it's semantics because of 12, 15 years ago when they missed the great financial crisis and they're trying to remain relevant. Now, if you take a look at TNX, you can see right here, you have your break right in the space and look at that break and how that's acting right so now you have an island reversal here we're going to talk about why 462 is such an important number what we really need to focus on are a couple things here we need to focus on the internals of the market what's smart money dumb money doing why that's significant what is a risk-free rate why you should care about it uh, we're really going to dive into some of this stuff today but you look at xlf i got a runaway breakout and that's a very different chart than what i had on thursday and if you don't understand that Take the time to learn because this is really significant stuff. Now, if you drop into the 12, the 22, and the 55, that's what I should use. You should use what you're comfortable with. Okay, I am testing in here, and I've been testing here for five days, and I am above. I'm coming into a cross. I'm staying above this on the 50 RSI. 
I broke the one DTL and now I've got a new closing high. Drop this on the weekly. Let's get rid of all my nonsense and just look at this on a weekly chart. Get rid of my lines. And when I have bars like this on the week that encapsulate weeks and then I close at the high, you want to pay attention to that. This is a really very simple on how you should be viewing the financial sector and you want to watch the financial sector because why? You cannot have a sustainable rally in the market without the financial sector. Just like the NASDAQ needs a leader, and I think we found it. And uh, I'm kind of somewhat surprised, but we'll get into that at the end. We're gonna tie this whole thing home. So we look at that. Now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? You're not being able to break the lows and you're getting wedged in here. So you're setting up for something. So maybe we should start watching the likes of JP Morgan and seeing how they're acting. And they're still kind of weak, aren't they? But we do want to play this out. We do want to watch what's going on there. The dollar is still having trouble with 106 on the week. And we can see why this is significant and what we have to watch about that. And we can see that very, very clearly in here and how that's playing out. So we will want to watch the dollar. We want to watch the top of this bar right here. It's really that 107 level, but you can see from where you cracked here. So there's very little to do here, guys. I mean, I can overlay all the indicators. They're all, the majority of them, just going to tell you exactly what's really happening in the market right now. So there's very little to do there. What I would focus on is where's the money going? And the money is going into very specific sectors as well. Now, we talked about this a month ago, and we're going to dr drive into this. But before we get there, there's the XLK. There's your driver of the S&P. There's your close. So you have an all-time closing high in the technology sector in the S&P. Right? One of the things that I've been saying for some time is that we're going to hit all-time highs by the end of the year. I don't know that we're going to. Okay? It certainly didn't look like that three weeks ago, did it? And when you have wars, wars, plural, you don't know how that's going to play out. And there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in there. Now, you had some macro events that changed three weeks ago. If you don't remember those, watch the video from last Saturday. I, I can't obviously go back in time. But you start looking at this on the SPY Weekly. Let's clone these. Save you 1500 bucks from taking a course. And there you are. So now you see your levels in here and you see how that's going. Okay, there's your cup. There's your handle. There's your breakout. All right, so that gets really clear on what's happening there, right? You need to see if you get the push. Where does all this stem from? It all stems from Japan, and we went through this about three weeks ago and saying, you wanna watch Japan and take your read from there. This is what we're dealing with, this is what's happening. Remember guys, when you're looking at the market and you're intraday trading, day trading, there's a lot of misconceptions about me that, oh, I'm a day trader, far from it. It's a portion of what I do. I have swing trades, I have different portfolios. I day trade, I swing trade, I have very long-term positions on. It, it, I find best to compartmentalize and not have them all in the same accounts. Uh, it's just from just the way that my mind works. I do better with compartmentalization. So you can see that you're sitting up here. Watch the Nikkei to determine what's going on. Also, their threat of yen intervention. And we're going to get to all that and why you need to pay attention to that. So this is leading. We see these weekly breakouts. There's not much more to talk about besides the cup and the handle. Can the spy get there? Can you get there in the next seven weeks? I don't have an answer for you. I don't know what the real driver is going to be unless the bond market absolutely collapses. You do have some things that we have to talk about. Maybe that's going to be the push. Let's take a look. Now, one of the questions I'm getting a lot are the S&P and then in regards to the 10 year bond or any bond for that matter. Why should you care? Why do you care about what the 10 year is doing? What is the correlation associated with this? To understand this, you need to understand three very specific things. You need to understand what a risk free rate is how that correlates to the market itself. You need to understand what earnings yield is, and you need to understand what real rates are. So there's three definitions we should go over. Then when we understand these definitions, at least have the basics of it, you'll understand why the bond market is important. And you'll understand why this correlation is so important. There's a reason why when rates drop on treasuries, the S&P goes up. And there's a reason why when rates are higher, the S&P drops. Let's, let's dig into it. Let's start with these three definitions. All right. What is a risk-free rate? A risk-free rate is the minimum return expected on an investment with zero risks by the investor. Meaning what can I earn and I have zero risks? Now there's always risk with everything. There's default risk. There's that your bank's going to go out of business. There's always risk. So say zero risk, everything has risk. But let's just say that the risk is minuscule. The fact that the US uh, defaults on debt minuscule versus any other country. It is the hy hypothetical rate of return in practice. It does not exist because every investment has a certain amount of risk. 
no matter what it is, your bank goes out of business, gold loses value, everything has risk. So it's a question of how you quantify it. But they come out and say risk-free rate. Risk-free rate used to calculate expected return on investments and the cost of capital, meaning the more risk that you take, the more return you're expected to make. If you're doing something highly speculative, you expect to make a higher degree of return than what you would saying buying a treasury bill. The minimum return expected of an investment with zero risk. This is risk-free rate. Now the next definition that we have to deal with is what are real rates? Real interest rates versus nominal interest rates. What is the difference? So here you have the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and this is as of August 2003. It doesn't really matter. The definition did not change. I just want to point that out. So what we're looking for here is the second definition before we get into these graphs and what we're going to have to understand. And that's understanding what's the difference between an interest rate and what's the difference between a real interest rate or real rates. The nominal interest rate or money interest rate is the percentage of increase you pay the lender for the use of money you borrowed. For instance, imagine you borrowed $100. A year ago at 8%, when you repay the loan, it's 100 plus the $8 of interest, a total of 108. Okay, that is a nominal interest rate. The nominal interest rate does not take into account inflation. To continue our scenario, suppose your way back, your bank offers inflation at 5% this year. Inflation's at 5% means that what you're purchasing your goods and services is 5% more expensive than it was last year. That's what inflation is. This leads to the concept of real or infl inflation adjusted interest rates. Okay, real or inflation adjusted interest rates, real rates. The real interest rate measures the percentage of increasing purchase power the lender received, then repays the loan. In some earlier example, the lender earned 8%, $8 on the loan, but inflation was five, so you really earned 3%, okay? So real rates is an inflation adjusted return on what you're either earning or paying. Keep that in mind. So in other words, if you were making a loan payment, to somebody, you would actually tack that on. They don't get into that here, but you should be aware of that. So you actually tack that on. Whereas the other way, right, it's coming out of your pocket. Either way, it's coming out of your pocket. But if you're you know, paying somebody the money, not only you're paying that, but also uh, that rate. But if you are doing it the other way, you're actually subtracting that rate off what you're getting to put in your pocket. And that's a really important distinction, but it's one that you should be made aware of. Now, let's just focus on this one more time so we get it because when we dive into these graphs, this is going to be really important, and you'll see that in one second here. But this leads to the concept of real inflation adjusted interest rates. So CPI, which is essentially inflation, subtract that number from your interest rate on your investment, whether or not that is a risk-free rate or some other investment like the S&P, which we will dive into in a second here. Now, in front of us is Fred. It's a little cut off up there, but that's okay. You guys get it. And uh, this is the St. Louis Federal Reserve. All right. So... Here we are, and what are we showing you? We're showing you 10-year real interest rates. We now know how that's calculated. We know that this takes into account inflation. Look at this period of time right here. You had negative real rates, negative. And then look at where you stopped having negative real rates. Look at the last time that this happened. So I wanna be really clear about this when you look at the S&P. Go back and look at the S&P during this period of time and look what happened when real interest rates went from negative to positive. You don't have a record. I maxed this out right here. You don't have a record back past this for Fred. And they're taking this actually from the Federal Reserve of Cleveland. But look where you are now. Look where you were. And look where you are now. Look when this happened last time. And look at what the S&P did during that period of time. I'll save everyone a lot of time. This is where the market ripped for a decade. Right? This is where you are now. And this is what we have going on. All right. Again, when we look at the market, we have to understand that we are viewing things from a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. So what we're doing here is we're explaining the larger picture, how you need to understand interest rates, how you need to understand uh, the, the real rates, what risk-free rate return is, so that when you look at this data, right, the, the devil's in the details. And when you understand the data and how the data is calculated and what it is, you can make more informed decisions. So when someone's telling you that the market's overbought or oversold, and we're going to get to how that might, there may be some validity to that, you can look at this and go, well, this is the risk-free rate and it's negative. So if I've got negative real rates, I don't have a choice but to take an excessive amount of risk. Hence, everyone's buying a JPEG, and that JPEG is what? Really, they call it an NFT, and everyone spends a million dollars on them, right? Okay. Now... If you go back and take a look at the market and we look at the S&P, look at the last peak of the market in March before we had our issue with regional banks and go look at how you are now at or above the same level on the 10-year real interest rate. Now, before we dive into this, the third definition you're going to need is what is earnings yield? 
Earnings yield helps investors understand how much they will be earning for each dollar invested in the company and therefore calculated as earnings per share divided by stock price per share. Earnings yield helps the investor understand how much they would be earning for each dollar invested in the company. Put one dollar in, how much are you getting for that dollar? This ratio helps investors make the comparison between two or more companies or between investments in shares versus where the investment risk-free securities. Okay, so what we know is we know that there's something called a risk-free rate, okay. and what they're suggesting is that you take the earnings yield and compare your corporation to that. In our scenario that we're gonna be getting into in a moment here, we're gonna take the earnings yield, and we're gonna be comparing the earnings yield to the risk-free rate, to tips, to some other investments, and see historically where we are, and this is gonna help you understand where the bond market is and why the bond market's so important right now. Now, this is gonna be a great example for us to use what we just learned and those definitions. S&P dividend yield, not earnings yield, we all know what the dividend yield is, I hope, versus CPI inflation and the stock market cycle, meaning it's showing you the cycles going back to 1947. I wanna be really clear about this. This is Edward Yardini. I've been following this guy for about 20 years. Uh, his work's excellent. And uh, he does have a, a paid service. I have no affiliation with it whatsoever. There are times when you can find these things online on Google by look to searching PDF and Yardini PDF. Uh, his work's absolutely exceptional. And it's if you're a fundamental or a, a stock nerd like I am and you really wanna dig into this stuff, this stuff's just great. It, it really is, because it just it lays out what's going on uh, very clearly. So here's the nominal rate. Now we all know what the nominal rate is. The nominal rate's just something, it's just there, right? It, it's not taking into account what? CPI, not what you're really earning, right? So here you are and we're going, okay, well, we're sitting here and we're getting 1.62%. If we own the S&P, that's what we're get, currently getting. All right, well, I could go out and buy a 10 year and that's what I'm getting. Okay, well, that's not great, right? Right, right. Here you are and you're getting negative real rates. You've been getting negative real rates on the S&P since you cracked back here during the pandemic this entire time. You can see historically other periods of time where this has happened. Now, what I would try to get you to understand a little bit is it even happened here. We had negative rates the whole time in 2003. It also happened in 82 when you broke out, which is pretty much the worst inflation we've had since 82. When this went positive, you went on a four year run once dividend yield got over. I'm not suggesting dividend yield's gonna get over, very different investing times, but this is a great graph for us to start before we dive in. Now, this is where it gets interesting because we get to use what we just learned. S&P reported earnings yield, CPI inflation. All right, so this is the yield versus inflation. So here's just the nominal rate, and now we know what nominal rate is, and I'll stop telling everybody, but we know the nominal rate is, we know that this is the earnings yield. Look at that number. 462. Where's the 10-year at right now? I should know where the 10-year is. I'm not going to flip to the graph. We should know where the 10-year is right now. Is there any reason to think that when the 10-year, which is the risk-free rate, right? The 10-year risk-free rate by the government, okay, is trading at 5% and the S&P earnings yield is 462 on a nominal basis. Is there any reason to own the stock market? Theoretically, no. So what you have, you might want to play this part again, you have pension funds that sit there and go, I have assumptions. What are my assumptions? I need to earn 7% because I'm the GM pension or I'm CalPERS, the California pension. And I need to earn 8% because if I earn 8%, I can pay out all these people that are entrusting me with their, with their life and their retirement. So if I'm getting 5% in the bond market, why would I buy the stock market? It makes zero sense. Where have you seen this, the greatest move in the stock market over the past year, when 10 year has gone from 5% to 4.5. People can't figure out why it moved. They're looking at the technicals. They're wondering why I changed my opinion about the market. And it's a great time to break out the stool, but for time's sake, I'm not going to. We all know the stool by now, and if you're not, welcome to the party. But you have the macro, you have the fundamental, and you have the technical side of the market. Macro rules everything around me, period. Okay, and then it goes from there. There are times when you'll lean technically, right now you're leaning macro. So if the nominal earnings yield is 462 and the 10 year then drops to 450 like it just did, then what do you have? Now we're gonna go back and just remember, remember this. Here's the S&P, what happened this day? The 30 year came out and it didn't price accordingly. And look how fast the S&P dropped at, that one, at the 30 year auction. We lost 55 basis points in about two or three minutes on the S&P. This is the 10-year, 
at the same time of that 30-year bond auction. Remember when we went over this on Thursday, we talked about a lot of this might have had to actually do with China. It actually came out Friday that it did have a lot to do with China. It's one of the reasons why we sell the relief rally. One of, and we'll get to that. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing this rise. So where was that rise? Right, so that was between, let's use the one o'clock level. So that was 457. Where did we stop? 465. Where did you stop right in here? 464. Let's use the peak. 465. What, what's in between this number? The earnings yield of the S&P. Do you think that's a coincidence that the market acted that way? Everybody's assumptions change, therefore they have to move. It's just that simple. Now, for time's sake, what I'm gonna explain, you're gonna to have to do on your own. Go look at what happens to the stock market when real earnings yield, we know what real is now because I've exhausted that ad nauseum. If not, go back, rewatch it. But you see where we're at? Okay, so we're at real earnings yield. Okay, so here's real earnings yield, real earnings yield. Go mark any of these spots any of these spots on the S&P and tell me what happens when real earnings yield goes from real earnings yield goes from negative to positive for the first time. Go tell me what the stock market does over the next three to five years and go and take a look. And there it is in a graph by itself. Again, this is not mine. This is Yardini.com and you can sometimes find this stuff online for free, believe it or not. U.S. equities reporting earnings yield minus CPA inflation rate. You can see where the average is. You can see where you're at. What do you think is going to happen when you get to the average? Now, this is important. So this is S&P reported earnings yield. We now know what the definition of this is. Leading economic indicators in cycle, stock market cycles. You can see this goes back from 59, 29. Again, Yardini, these are not my graphs. So what do we have here? We have the leading economic indicators. They are in red. See that? All right. See where we're at here? What we don't want to have happen is we do not want the leading economic indicators to get worse. Why? If the leading economic indicators drop, earnings yield is going to drop. If the leading economic indicators drop, earnings yield is going to drop. This is not rocket science. If the economy gets worse, companies aren't going to earn the same amount of money. That's just the way it is. But understand this graph. So that's why people will look at the economic data to make a decision on what the stock market is doing. That's why they will look at economic data to make a decision on what the stock market is doing. So when we're all sitting there and we're all watching our squiggly lines on the CPI and what's FCI doing, we're all trying to read the tea leaves, this is why. Now I'm gonna just take a moment to point something out. This is all based upon S&P earnings yield. And this was a report that I have from Yardini, but I always think this is interesting. S&P PE. Now he looks at PE differently for a different reason. I may show some of that in a moment here, but what, what's so fascinating to me about this is PE to me is completely irrelevant and it's always irrelevant when I trade. And this is just a great example as why. I mean, PE is literally all over the map on this chart from 1935 to 19, uh, they actually go to 2027, obviously we're not there yet. But you look at this and go, oh, well, you, you can see very clearly that uh, CPI, no, CPI is not leading this. I mean, PE spikes, this is where inflation is. C CPI spikes, I mean, maybe if you didn't put 1.7 trillion in the market, but you know, 81. So it's to me, it's completely immaterial where PE is. There's to me, there's no correlation. And it's not something that I look at. And it's when people say, well, this is the PE of the stock, I, I could really care less. Now, this is where it gets fascinating. This is what I this is what I care about, this kind of stuff. And this makes you kind of go, okay, well, this may be an issue. S&P forward earnings yield minus 10-year tips. Remember the risk-free rate? Remember real rates? Okay, so now this graph ties in all three of those definitions into one graph perfectly, right? Because now we have the risk-free rate, we have it tied into real rates and earnings yield, and we have it all mapped out for us. So what this is showing is it's showing earnings yield, meaning what is the market earning over what you're getting in a 10-year treasury. And this is the one graph that if you're you know, kind of a bear on the market and you're saying things are expensive. So like people may have heard like David Tepper on TV talking about this is the most expensive market in the world historically ever, and he's bearish on stocks. This is why he's bearish on stocks. So it's really important that you just don't look at the data that you want to look at, but you look at what's going on. So this is really all I'm earning over right now. This is all I'm earning over a 10-year treasury yield on the earnings yield of the S&P. You guys, you have to do me a favor. You're going to have to comment on this. Is this too, is this too detailed? Um, I'd like you to share this video a lot so people can understand really what is driving this market, why you need to stop just looking at technicals, why you need to dig into this and at least have the most basic knowledge of what the heck is going on out there, right? We are playing against the smartest, most disciplined people in the world. And there's a reason for that. This is where the money is. This is where the returns are, right? That's why it's asymmetrical returns. Those that have knowledge, those that don't. So I am a technical trader. I am a pattern trader. 
But this kind of stuff, this is how real money moves. Remember, they are the sharks, we are the remora. We have to think like that. But I would appreciate your comments on this. Is this way too detailed? Have I lost you? Uh, if I have lost you, maybe I should do this in like different parts of videos. Um, and if you do get value from this, I please, would you share this one? Because I think this is really significant. And I think this is going to help people go, why do I care about the dollar? Why do I care what Japan's doing? Why do I care about the bond market? What's an earnings yield? There's a lot here. Okay. There's a lot here. So S&P forward earnings yield. You can see the S&P forwards earnings yield in blue and how it's going. And your tips yield. Okay. If you are to look at this and you are looking for an area where you're saying, I, I am historically bearish on stocks. This gives you something to look at and go, well, you have, you have an issue. Why would I buy this? Or why would I buy the S&P when I could buy this? The number one reason why you would is because we're expecting inflation to drop. So after the tips start to drop, then the yield is gonna go higher, right? On a comparison basis. But until then, it's not. So we're, what does that mean? Let's go back to this graph. So let's say that we look at this graph, right? And we look at the world as a reversion to means. There's always a reversion to mean. And what do I, I mean that there's an average, right? To an extent, I know, I know average and mean is different. So to the uh, statisticians and the guys that have PhDs in electrical engineering, I appreciate your comments, but I, I got it. <laughs> but for our intents and purposes, we're gonna do it this way. And we're gonna mark this off. All right, so cool. So now we have that line. And we could say that three, and we could say that nine are extreme readings, right? And then we're gonna say everything in the me everything in there is gonna take us to another level. Okay, where's that other level gonna be? It's gonna be a different color. So let's just say that this is a nine, this is a three. We could say that six is the average. Now maybe it's not, it's maybe, you know, maybe this is a little skewed and maybe therefore it's a little higher, but I'm not gonna do the math. We're gonna leave it at this for our purposes. What is this gonna tell us? This is going to tell us that this is the average. Well, that means a couple things historically. One, when we were here, we're going to do what? We're going to revert to a mean. Think of Bollinger Bands. Picture if this had Bollinger Bands on it right now. See where you are right here? See where you're at? Okay, so are you gonna to revert to a mean? Now, if you revert to a mean, what is that gonna to do to the stock market? Just think about that. So I hope you found that helpful. You should now know those three definitions. You should have a basis on why the market's doing what it's doing. You should have a better understanding of why the bond market and why you should care about it. Remember, there are these three legs. There is the technical, there is the fundamental. The macro right now is the weighting because you have that battle going on between earnings yield and the 10 year yield. I'm gonna bring out this graph because it's been a while, but remember, all we're doing is trying to solve the puzzle. We're just putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And if you don't know what the corners are, there's no way you're gonna be able to figure out what you're supposed to do in the middle. All right, let's get into some stocks. Let's start with what's not rosy. Tesla has broken this 200 day moving average. Now, I'm not sure why they're attacking all the EV, EV guys. I actually thought Rivian had a good quarter. Uh, I might, maybe I'm the only one that thought it was a good quarter because as soon as it got to the 200, it rejected. Uh, they are just completely metumboing all of these EV charts. Now I get the NIOs, although when you really look back at it, you take a look at the investments that these companies are getting by the VW, uh, Lucid, I get, they have a ton of issues there. I, I don't think that they're all around to say the least, but they're, they're just going after all these companies. So I'm not really sure, let's clean this one off. I'm not really sure why they're going after all of them. And if you have an idea, please comment below. The, the only thing I would say about Tesla for me was I had a, a long, long-term position. Now, long-term position, it's interesting because when I do these videos, I always hear people say, oh, he's a day trader, he's this, he's that. I, I'll be blunt, I compartmentalize everything that I do. So I have accounts where they're day trades, swing trades, and then literally like multi-year trades. I, have a, I had a very long-term position in Tesla. Uh, that position ended this quarter on that earnings call. That earnings call was abysmal. And the idea that this company is gonna grow the same way, he'll probably figure it out, he always does, right? But that changed a lot for me, that, that earnings call. Uh, it was very different. And I think he's got problems with the Cybertruck. It's why I actually like Rivian, but I'm just not seeing the love in the EV names. To me, this made uh, a pretty significant move to the downside. Now, you've been riding this line on Tesla and you've just been unable to do anything with it. Now, you see this rally that's up in here. This actually, when you break like this, it, it provides a really interesting opportunity to get involved. We actually shorted this uh, on Friday and did very well with it. I always get asked to not only talk about entries and names, but how to exit. So that's why I wanted to preface this with the trades that I do. A lot of people, again, will assume that, oh, it, it, he's day trading, he's swing trading. I do everything. And you have to and you have to think that, think about it from this way. Like when we just look through all those earnings yields and what the 10 years doing, you have the market. And let's just say the market's gonna go down for, I don't know, let's just do it this way because I don't like the way that that looks. Let's do it this way. 
let's say the market's going to go down for a week. All right, I got it together now. Let's say the market's going to go down for a week and then it's going to bounce in a week and it's going to go a little higher. All right, well, when you look at that over a month, you might just get a line that looks like this. What we need to do is understand that, right? And understand that there's going to be volatility inside each of these bars. Each one of these bars is six and a half hours of trading. That means that you have 13 half hour bars in there. You have six and a half hour bars. You can break it down by five minute increments, however you want to do it. You have to understand what each one of these represents. There's little battles going on in every single one of these bars. You can profit from that if you want to. You don't have to. And there's other ways to trade. But in this scenario, when I break a 200, that is really very clear to me to be looking at a short trade. So we had a short trade in this. And one of the things I'm always asked about is, how do you get out of your positions? Like when you have a winning trade, when do you know it's over? How do you scale out of it? And one thing that I'm going to take, I want you to take away from before we even put this on is I want, I want you to watch this, but you have to remember these two words. You have to remember these two words, positive slippage. Now let's watch this. Sam, I just don't want to do it into that number because if that number is good, they're just going to rip it. So I'm just watching. This looks like a, literally it's a perfect short. Like it's perfect. I just don't want to do it because in three minutes I'm getting that data, but you're literally shorting using this. And then if it happens, you just get out of the way, but you're staring right at it. A put for next week. That's of interest and just do it that way and just leave that on the two tens I bought. I paid five bucks for them. So you can put that out there, John, I'm short Tesla here. I bought the five tens. I bought the two tens. I paid $5 for them. If I get over that bar, I'll just close the whole trade. And it's just me adding to that short position on Tesla when you hear that little bell going, but I'm just playing around with it, building it in case it really breaks. You should trade, you should trade up and try and stop me out, right? Let's see if it does or it just collapses upon itself. You have 10% on those options now and we're red. First one of the big guys to go red tells you everything you need to know. Paid five, I might close some of these at six. I have a bunch of them. Let's see until it does. Although I think that things in a lot of trouble if it breaks here. That was perfect, wasn't it? I just didn't want to do it ahead of that number. Maybe that next bar down. This will be perfect. That long bar down from there. Watch everybody panic. All right, you're up. 20% on those. If you want to pull something out, go for it. Or if you get stock, you're up dollar and a half to $2 now. Up to you what you do here. You take out lows of the day. You really could. Let's see. See what happens here. Well, you're up at least 20, 25% of that trade now. Or you're in, or you, you shorted stock and you did TSLS. All you'd want to do is break, put, put it at break even now. I would. The stuff that got one day and that was it. That's all it did. Tesla's cracking. Put the right trade on at the right time. And if that's not it, then you just find another spot for it. It's not a big deal. We have a buck and a half on those options now and well over $2 on the short. If you're a, a short-term trader, you want to be pulling money out now. When you're breaking down like this, you want to be pulling money out of the trade, right? You're coming into that wick, wicks are what? Price rejection. So we know right here, okay, we know on this trade, on this short that we did, we know that an algorithm or high frequency trader stopped us right here. We know that, right? So we need to make sure that we break that. And if we break that, great. If we don't break that, you're going to want to watch the bounce. And you can also look at the option market. See how the option market did not sell down there, okay? The option market did not break and go lower when that happened. So that's a sign that you're probably going to want to trim into that, okay? So I trimmed the position right here. 630, I paid five for it. I had stock, so I trimmed stock too, up about three bucks in the stock, maybe a little more. I don't think it's, I got to go look at the average. But if the option didn't move, now the option's moving. So you're probably going to crack now. So if you watch the puts, right? See how the puts are moving right now? You want to be real careful here because they defended it there before. Remember Wicks or price rejection? That's an algorithm or high frequency trader organization or organizations. So you just want to watch how they, you know, how do they respond to the level? Do they defend the level? Do they give the level up, right? You just want to watch that. And the option hit a new high on the day. So right now it's doing what it's doing. Like we just want to want to kind of watch. So I don't really want to close it all. I want to let it go and see if that, you know, how ugly this can get. Cause I think it can get ugly. Buy, let's see. And let's watch that. And what you do is now you just use the high of that bar. But there it goes. Okay. And then go from there. All right. So now you're at seven on those. So now you're up over $2 on those puts. You can pull more out here. Let's take a look at that level. I think you're going to just go right to it and test it. But let's see. See what happens here. 40% on the puts. You're up hours on the stock now. I broke. I don't see any. I've already trimmed. I don't see any reason to do more trimming yet. If they give me a reason, then I'll do it. If I go right to that 206.68. They're probably going to defend this bullish engulfing right here. Someone's going to try to defend that. I would think you're not going to go through that like butter. So watch this too, because you never really closed there. You never had to follow through there. So let's watch that too and see what happens there. Yeah, that guy's still there, isn't he? Let's say seven and a quarter. I mean, straight down is not a pattern. So there's got to be something there. So the, again, optimal would have been up here, but I don't want to do that into that number. 
because I don't know what that number is going to be. All right. So right into this, I'm probably going to cover some. Let's see. What, yep. All right. So right into that. I trimmed the stock up close to $5, actually over $5 on the average. And I trimmed the options at $7.50. Everything's at a minimum now. My stop on the entire rest of that trade I'll show you is right here. All right. So if I get a close over that, I'm just going to get out of the way. But now my close is right here. Oop. Like that. At 208.29. And I'll just leave the rest on. All right. So now you're at eight bucks on it. And you want to scale out into that move. All right. You want to trim. You're at eight bucks. You paid. Five, you made three. So you want to pull money out into that and you want to pull a stock out into that. Like when you see these bars, I'm trimming into this. I'm not cheering. I'm not saying I'm so smart. It's going to 200. I'm pulling money out when this is happening, right? Look at the trajectory of this. It's straight down. Do you think there's a bounce out there? You think you want to be around waiting for it? No, you want to scale out into it, right? You don't want to be around for this second guessing yourself. Else. You already know that there's a bullish engulfing there. You already know they defended this level. You trim into this, right? Now look, right? That's why we trim into this and we get positive slippage and let everybody else cover up here. And look at the options. It's a dollar difference in the options by what I just explained, right? This is why you scale out into this, okay? We don't want to be this guy. Let somebody else be that guy. We don't want to be cheering here. We want to be locking in profit. And now the rest of that profit, the rest of my trade, you notice when I'm trading here, I don't even have a nine on here. I don't have anything. I don't have volume. I'm not even looking at RSI. I'm just actually reading what's happening. After a while, you get so proficient, you can just look at price. But you know, I used to put the guardrails on. You want them, but you get what I'm, hopefully you get what I'm putting down. But you can tell what's going to, like you can say it. But anyway, when you have something like this, okay, that might mark a bottom. doesn't really matter. We scaled out into it. We scaled the whole way down. What you don't want is to be trimming into that, right? You just, oh, I, you know, I hope this works. That's not going to work. Hope's not a strategy. Now, I hope you found that helpful. I have a lot of comments to show more live trades. I want to be really clear. Not every trade works out that way. You're going to have losing trades and winning trades. You must cut your losers. You must not say this time's different. Even if this time is different and there's no greater example, let me give you one that did not work even though I, I was right. I obviously wasn't right because the trade didn't work. I'm very comfortable with this TNA and buying this TNA. I get a bar like this. My stop on that, this trade is 70. I close at 67. I use on my swing trades or long-term trades, I always use the close. I don't use the interim moves. And in this trade, that was it, I'm out. I got stopped out by three cents. The next day it went up and I would have made 75 cents back. Now, it doesn't matter to me. You have to have a process and you have to honor it. I hope that's clear. Let's get into some of these names. Now, the move in NVIDIA to me was staggering. And a couple things about it. Why was this staggering? Friday's move was staggering. All right, so why? Here's your undercut and we know that. This is a double bottom. I don't care what anybody says, that's a double bottom. You undercut, you reversed, and you popped over. You're going into earnings. This is the last game in town before the end of the year, guys. If somebody's trying to make their year end and they're a hedge fund, you got, you got one dance left to go find a partner and this is it. Uh, this close tells you everything. Now, why is that? So you look at that close and you go, okay, well, that is a close of 483.35. And you just come across and go, well, this close was 492.64, okay? What was this close? 487.84, okay? So I literally have two closes on a chart that are higher than this. Out of this entire chart, I've got two, all right? You need to take account of things like that. Let's drill into this on a weekly. Let's mark this off. All right. So there we sit, how about here? The close on this day was 485.09. Where are we? 483.35. You literally have one close on a weekly chart. That's all you have. Right? Now, if you were to look at this, you have the mother of all flags. And people say, well, it's not a flag because this is larger than this. I, I would tell you that you know, maybe don't be so stringent with your definitions and just look for pattern recognition. And in this, in this, you have a failed head and shoulders break it, breakdown. There's nothing stronger, nothing stronger than a failed pattern breakdown. And the reason for that is because you have people that are on the other side of the trade and you should be able to say it by, you know, left, right, there's your break, doesn't happen, boom, everyone's matumboed and there you go from there, right? You can get matumboed here as well. So you get this, you need to watch this going to earnings. What I was absolutely shocked by were a couple things on Friday. Number one, Taiwan Semi coming back over the 200 week moving average. I don't understand how people didn't see this and why this data is so important. And what I'm getting and what, where my head is with it is I think that people are not, I think back here we had different sentiment. And I think this goes back to, and let me rephrase that. I think this goes back to where we were. 
right? So like here we are October 19th and then every month they tell you what their capacity utilization is like clockwork. There's nothing that came out here that you couldn't extrapolate out that was coming out this day. The fact that we did this on that data to me means sediment change. And the only thing that I can come up with, okay, well, why is the sediment changing? So I go back to the 10 year, right? And then I go and take a look at October and go, well, right around that October time frame. here's October 20th. Okay, well, the 10 year was at five, go to Taiwan semi and you're like, okay, well, that was the 20th. And maybe that's why, because we were at five and now we're at four and a half. So maybe it's the earnings yield because, and I'm not gonna do all this, but the earnings yield of a corporation, okay, also matters as much as the earnings yield of, a, of the S&P, right? There is, there is a, a process there. I'm not gonna do it all now, but so, all right. So you look at this and you're watching this pop over, Matumbo off the 200, rips off the 200. The capacity utilization is what drove AMD and demand for chips. That's what drove this. This was the level that we thought AMD could get to. There is nothing, if you're looking at these charts and you're waiting for them to do something technically, welcome to the party. Okay, I, I, I had a DTL rejection and a negative RSI divergence before Friday. This is what I'm saying. This all can reverse. You have to keep your head on a swivel when you're looking at technical analysis. And you have to adapt, adapt or die. You have to be able to change your opinion. Right, tying your opinion to ego and saying, no, no, we have to do this, we have to do that. I'll, I'll be on the other side trying to make money. That's where my head is. It doesn't mean I don't have to be right, all right? So uh, Friday, I had a huge thesis that this was gonna get smoked. Guess what didn't happen? You didn't get smoked. I thought TTD was gonna absolutely rip and it did rip a little bit. So people made some money in the room trading it. None of that mattered because everything that I did was predicated upon making money. So anything that I thought was gonna happen that didn't happen is completely irrelevant because then I'm putting trades on like that Tesla trade you just watched and I'm pulling money out of it. All right, so let's get back to this. So then we see Taiwan and we see this ripping. Well, what is this telling you? All right, well, that's a W guys. Call it what you want, that's a W. Take a look at this. All right, so now I've got a death cross here and that death cross is becoming negated because I'm over the 200. This is Taiwan Semi. So then you start looking really at these numbers and going, well, if that's the SOX and I'm back above the 55, and let's be really clear, if you think something didn't change on Friday, because people say, well, Thursday you said this. If you don't see the difference in the chart between this and that, you need to stop and start with the basics. Look up, look up a book called Technical Analysis Explained by Dr. Martin Prang, start there an actual technical analysis book. Reads like stereo instructions, but it's excellent. So you pop out right here, you made a higher high. So let's get rid of all my nonsense. Let's get rid of my line. And let's pretend that we don't look at any kind of trend lines and we think that they're all nonsense. And let's just look at supply and demand. Okay. Here's your undercut, here's your doji, here's your close above the doji. A higher high, close, and you have a confirmed double bottom. You don't have to be at the bottom of a chart to have a double bottom, all right? You can see the trend line, you can see how you're going. Pop in your 200 and you're now pointing up. Pop in the 20, which some people use, and you're getting across there, all right? I don't use the 20. I use the 12, the 22, the 55, and the 200. You should use what you're comfortable with. So one thing that has bothered me, why am I spending time on this? The one thing that's bothered me is we need a leading sector. I think we're getting it and I think it's semis. Cloud, cloud is rejecting, the software is rejecting 55. Now, I didn't think TTD was all that bad candidly. I thought you was a dumpster fire, but I didn't think TTD was that bad. So then you start looking into these other names like taking a look at CRM and you start realizing that you're holding the 55 in here. Why is this important? Let's take a look at Adobe. Why is that important what Adobe's doing? Okay, these are all corporate names. What do I mean by corporate names? Just like Microsoft is. I mean, we've been talking about this for weeks that it's an absolute monster. And here you are at all time highs. We just talked about this a week ago and here we are again, just exploding to the upside. So we understand that Microsoft, Adobe, okay? And you can even, people will say Oracle. I'm not, I'm not loving this right now on Oracle, but I would focus on CRM and I would focus on Adobe. Okay? and I would focus on Microsoft. Why? These are all software services companies. So is Oracle, so is Oracle. And they're all moving. Now take a look at this. What's Dell doing? I don't know. It's just breaking out of a, a weekly pendant. We can always clone these and I just saved you 1500 off taking a course. So if you take a look at that right there, I, it doesn't get any cleaner. I did not take a position this and a bunch of other stuff on. All right, so now you get this trade and you follow the money and where the money's going. Why would, corporations be seeing flow into their names that have to deal with CapEx. What is CapEx? Capital expenditure of corporations. Corporations only spend money, they're sociopaths. Why do corporations spend money? Because they're gonna make more money. If you make more money, you're gonna have more earnings. If you have more earnings, your earnings yield is gonna go up on the S&P. Hopefully you follow all that. That's it.